This is a narration of chapter 1976 from the White Book, taken from Google Books, available free online. 1976, The Unseen Hand, Brazil, Salvador, 1957. It's the third largest city in Brazil, and with 85%, it's 3 million residents black and living in abject poverty. Bahians say it is more African than Africa. Residents of its favelas are are housed in cement shanties built on the side of large grassy hills, little more than mud-packed cinder blocks topped with sheets of aluminum to keep the rain out. It was early evening as Adriana hurried past the others to hers. A young boy stood naked in the doorway, throwing rocks at chickens plucking for food near the outhouse. Next to them, a wood-burning stove heat a large pot of water, and from the burnt orange western skies, the Samba de Rota played the outro for the day. Stop! said Adriana to her son. He threw the rest of the rocks on the ground. She took his hand and led him to a tub in the yard. The neighbor's dog barked at them. The boy yelled, Stop! And the barking ceased. Adriana smiled at her little man as she brought the water to the tub and poured it in. The temperature was right, and the boy sat down. Adriana pulled a sheet for privacy, gave her son a sponge, and told him to wash himself as she took a seat next to the tub, fished out his foot, and began clipping his toenails while he covered his skin in lather. She pretended not to notice him impatiently waiting for her to speak. Mommy, remember you promised to? Yes, yes, mijo, I remember. Which story do you want me to tell? My favorite, he said, splashing about the water happily. The unseen hand. Adriana bristled in her seat, knowing all along what her son wanted to hear. Believing it was nothing more than a fantastic bedtime story, It had been his only request since she told it to him. Adriana questioned if she'd done the right thing by telling him so young. Had she traded his innocence for the knowledge of the workings of the world? Over the years, the thought had seemed inconceivable even to adults. A group so influential that it guides world events and policies? So enigmatic that people question their proven existence? so progressive, audacious, and relentless in their goals that they've succeeded in designing and building a pyramid of nations? Really? Even she'd found it hard to believe until she met one of them face to face. Harlem, 1976. The man approaching the home was knowledgeable of many things, but how to make peace with his only son was not one of them. After spending the last seven years of his life waging war, he was happy to be home in the Empire State that men like he and his father had helped to build. He climbed the stairs and braced himself as he pressed the button. New York Harbor, 1906. The bells on the docks signaled an incoming ship. As an urchin on the streets of Edinburgh, Robert had always dreamed of seeing the New World. Now, after weeks at sea, He was about to set foot on it. Born again is how he described the feeling as the green lady's light guided the travelers into Ellis Island. On these shores, he'd been told, everything and everyone moves upward. He felt honored to be there, and he owed it all to the craft. Scotland, 1946. Seven miles outside of Edinburgh stood the 500-year-old Rosalind Chapel. Inside, dressed in full regalia, several members of New York's Old Holland Lodge, number eight, listened closely to a Grand Master. 1118, our beginning in history is merely a drop in the ocean of time. We owe those beginnings to the visions of men like Priory of Sion founder Godfrey de Bouillon and his nephew, King Baldwin II of Jerusalem, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Andre de Montbard, our first Grand Master Hughes de Payens, and lest we not forget, Henry St. Clair and those original nine Christian soldiers who took the vow of poverty to protect pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land. Taking up residence among the ruins of the great King Solomon's Temple, they were recognized as the poor knights of the Temple of Solomon. From those sacred grounds, a glorious turn of events brought to the order good fortune, and wealth, and from then on, whenever French and English nobles needed money to fund their wars, they turned to the order. We were happy to lend it and collect what was called a crusading fee. 
if the nobles defaulted on the loans, which they often did, the order gained ownership of their land and property. When the time came for the order to build their own property, they employed the very same stonemasons as the kings and popes had to build castles and cathedrals throughout Europe. Those military strongholds eventually became the first safe deposit houses, allowing wealthy travelers to store valuables in one country and safely withdraw them in another, again for a fee of course. In fact, you'd do well to say that modern banking is the invention of the Knights of the Temple. By the year 1207, the order had built a fleet of ships that they used for trade during maritime. By 1240, that fleet had increased substantially and could be found haunting established trade routes engaging in what we call privateering, the capturing of merchant ships at sea, others call it pirating, and soon the ship's flag, or Jolly Roger, the skull and crossbones, became notorious on the high seas. Sailors and merchants began lodging complaints that fell on deaf ears, for by then, we held the deeds to nearly 10,000 properties in Europe alone, and we'd become the wealthiest order in the world, the Knights Templar. By the year 1307, even France's King Philip was indebted to us. Jealousy and spite had grown in the hearts of men, and rumors of heresy, including homosexuality and Satan worship, plagued the order's 20,000 members. The sitting Pope, Urban II, dealt with charges that the order was secretly practicing magic they were accused of learning from the Semites during the Crusades. Then came that dreadful day, Friday the 13th of October 1307, when King Philip ordered all knights in France arrested and detained and ordered their assets seized. In 1312, Pope Clement V issued the decree Vox Clementis, thereby dissolving the order. Alas, on March 14, 1314, after years of torture, Templar Grandmaster Jacques de Molay was burned alive in the square of Notre Dame. But as destiny would have it, a large number of our brothers escaped France, the holds of their ships filled with what has been called the treasure of all treasures. Some of those brothers built a home here, inside these very walls where they were twice born, and in the year 1717, the Mother Grand Lodge of England was formed, and the Templars were renamed the Fraternal Order of Free and Accepted Masons. The name Freemason, as well as their symbol of a G, imposed between the architectural tools of a compass and square, is known by many, but understood by few. The lodges of operative masons, actual stone working masons, dates back to the Middle Ages, while speculative masonry, the process of spiritual advancement, based on the study of history, philosophy, astrology, and mathematics, flourished late in the 17th century during the Age of Reason. Obligatory questions are often raised as to whether Masonry is a 10 million member religion or a cult, a haven for free-thinking individuals, or a Lucifer worshipping conspiracy against Christianity, a fun-loving lodge, or a secret society involved in criminal activities that rival the Mafia. The answers, due greatly to its own duplicitous nature, one that has created schisms between black Masons and white Masons, as well as American Masons and the rest of the world, appear to be forever lost to time. Secrecy, you see, is of the utmost importance to the Mason, and according to their own oaths, if broken, could result in a number of gristly ritualistic deaths. Secret handshakes and passwords are used to keep impostors out, and even among their own, they rely on a complex series of ranks and levels of admission called degrees that segregate one from another. Upon completion of the initial three degrees, the Blue Lodge, the celebrant may choose one of two paths of wisdom. The York Rite, consisting of an additional 10 degrees for a total of 13, or the Scottish Rite, which includes an additional 29 for a total of 32 degrees. At that time, the celebrant may be invited to join the ultra-secretive and coveted honorary 33rd degree. Researchers have also found beyond it are another set of hidden grades and other secret societies referred to as Illuminized Masonry. 
that the celebrant may seek admission to, making them essentially a fraternity within a fraternity. Celebrated Masonic author, 33rd degree Mason, and former Grand Commander Albert Pike may have described it best when he wrote, Freemasonry has two doctrines, one concealed and reserved for the masters, the other public. As both a speculative and an operative Mason, Robert Devine was a dying breed. He made his living as one of the Skywalkers that helped construct the vertical city after the invention of the elevator. His son, Alioisis, could remember watching and wanting to be just like him as he scaled the girders of the Empire State Building. Robert, though, had other plans for his only son. Alioisis Devine graduated West Point in 1942 just in time to join his alum, General George S. Patton's German campaign. A courageous and decorated officer at the war's end, he was tapped to assist the OSS, a special group of agents devised by the U.S. to combat the manufactured communist threat in Russia and South America. The identities and actions of these operatives were to remain covert, and in 1947, from this group, the Central Intelligence Agency was born. Part of their oath was for Du Menumke Jus, God in my right. Just as Robert Devine had always proclaimed it should be, to Robert, Alioisis was on track in moving toward his destiny. Today, he expressed his appreciation by returning with his son to the sacred grounds of Rosalind to perform the rites of the sublime degree. Let the brother receive the light. The participant removed Alioisis' blindfold. He was raised from one knee, a new man, and an esteemed company. You may now add your name to a list of great men, said Robert. There's Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Benedict Arnold, Samuel Colt, and Harlan Sanders, just to name a few. And from this day forth, may you do everything in your power to preserve our integrity and traditions. Harlem, 1976. The sound of the doorbell brought a rush of memories to the mind of Diosis Divine. August 1967. That's when his mother, Adriana, passed, the victim of a robbery gone bad. It was also the year his aunt, Dania, brought him to his new home. A week later, the sound of the doorbell brought an unexpected visitor. Dania opened the door, took one look at the man's face, and was taken back 17 years to when she and her sister worked for the Church of Our Lady of the Rosary of Blacks a house of worship founded in the early 1800s by a secret brotherhood of slaves who until then had been unable to pray to their Eryxos in peace. One day, mysterious men showed up asking questions about the church. Adriana had found herself inexplicably attracted to one of them, and soon Daniel would wake in the middle of the night and find Adriana's bed empty. Neighbors talked of seeing her and a man walking hand in hand along the beaches under the moonlight. Then one day, the man vanished as mysteriously as he'd come, and nine months later, Adriana gave birth to a boy. After a brief conversation with the man, Dania led him into her home and called for her nephew. Come, mijo, she said. There is someone here to meet you. Diosis was curled up on the bed, still mourning his mother's death. He got himself together and went downstairs, where he found a strangely familiar face looking back at him. Hello, son. I don't know what your mother told you about me. My name is Alioisis. I'm your... Diosis knew it before the words came out. Even so, he was in shock, studying the man's mouth as he spoke. Adriana was 18 when we met. We were very much in love. Diosis was picking up his only bits and pieces of a story that he knew couldn't possibly be true. If you loved her, why didn't you stay with us? Why no visits, no calls, no letters? Alioisis tried to explain. I did those things, son, on several occasions. It was your mother who preferred that we not meet. Diosis thought of his mom. If that is true, then she had good reasons. Alioisis took a deep breath, sighed, and gave Diosis a condescending grin. Son, I don't expect you to understand. Those were troubled times, and we believed our arrangement was for the best. Diosis flashed a look that could kill. Because of your arrangement, my mother is dead, and you could go to hell. Diosis stormed out of the room. 
For over a year, Aliwaisis tried, but couldn't reach him. Diosis began hanging out on the streets of Harlem, dabbling in the life he'd left behind as a peewee in the city of God. Aliwaisis wasn't having that. I'll kill him myself before I let you, he told Dana's husband, Toby, during a visit to the family's home. Then, late in 1969, Diosis felt the grip of the unseen hand when Ali Weiss and his best friend Benjamin Friedman used their connections to have him drafted and placed under Ali Weiss's command. The day he arrived in Vietnam, Diosis was called in to see his commanding officer. After a brief introduction, and much to his dismay, Colonel Devine stepped from the shadows. Frightened and confused, Diosis asked why his own father had sentenced him to die. Ali Weiss answered, it's time for you to do the right thing, Diosis. You're my son. You owe it to me and this great nation. You will satisfy your duty to both. Diosis wiped the tears from his face before he responded. Who do you think you are, man? I don't owe you shit. It ain't me, man. I ain't the fortunate son. I hope your time out here brings you some clarity, replied Ali Weisses. Maybe then you'll understand just how fortunate you are. Diosis opened the door and came face to face with the father he hadn't seen in years. Other Weisses had been right about one thing. Their time in the jungle had forced them to see each other differently and formed a delicate bridge of respect between the two. But Diosis would never understand how his father had chosen his career over his family and he had no interest in understanding the twisted morals and dogma of the Scottish Rite. Ali Weisses, on the other hand, had all but given up him ever becoming free and accepted, and at 55, having never married and with no children, it looked as if the Divine's family association with the Order would end with him. But destiny sometimes has a will of its own. Each man nodded at the other as they shook hands. Diosis motioned for him to come in. Ali Weisses smiled as Dania took his hat and coat and escorted him to the couch. You want something to drink? she asked. Diosis kissed her on the cheek and answered, He's having a Manhattan. I'll get it. Dania hurried upstairs, and Ali Weisses stopped surveying the room long enough to admire the man his son had become. Dania and Toby have kept the place looking good. Modest, but spotless, with all new plastic-covered furniture. Do you have anything to do with that? Diosis said nothing for a moment. He took a seat on the couch and gave his father a drink. We both do, but why don't we go easy on the interrogations today? Agreed, said Ali Weisses, holding up his glass. Diosis touched it with his. They clinked and each took a sip. I want to thank you for everything. Please, Diosis, don't. I appreciate it, but now isn't the time. I'm here today to thank you for allowing me this opportunity. It means the world to me. We're going to have a wonderful time. It should be quite the experience for both of us. I'm sure it will, said Diosis. It's all he's talked about since you invited him. Just then, Dania appeared at the top of the stairs with a handsome young six-year-old. Diosis called to him. Well, don't just stand there, fortunate. Come down and say hello to your grandfather. Washington, District of Columbia, the Bicentennial. Butterflies danced in the child's stomach as he looked down from the plane onto Washington Square. They were headed to the bicentennial celebration where Ali Weisses had promised Diosis that Fortunate would learn the history of the American patriots and the inception of their new world free from the hand of the British Empire. Diosis finally agreed, knowing all along at some point his father would be compelled to include just how much influence a group of Freemasons had on our nation's capital. What is Freemasonry, Grandpapa? Ali Weisses reached into his pocket and produced one Federal Reserve note. He handed it to Fortunate, who studied it carefully. Now turn it over. As Fortune did that, Ali Weisses reached into his pocket again, this time producing a Swiss Army knife. He placed the magnifying glass over the number one in the right-hand corner. What do you see? Oh, look, Papa, answered Fortune. It's an owl. Very good said Ali Weisses as he placed the glass over the great seal of the United States and spoke. As you will discover, the hand that Freemasonry has played in not only the building of this city, 
but of this nation is clear to all those who are wise enough to see as he sees. The craft is the thread that links the ancient mysteries to the modern world. It is the light, and it is what made everything that you see before you possible. In the 1660s, the plot of land down there numbered 666 was called Rome. Over a hundred years later, after the Revolutionary War, a Gaul descendant and Frere Macon by the name of Charles L'Enfant began plans for marvels like that there. Aliwaisis motioned to Jones Point, where the first stone of the federal city was laid on April 15, 1791, between the hours of 3.30 and 4 o'clock p.m., when the beautiful virgin Virgo was at her zenith. And over there, he pointed to the Washington Monument, a 550-foot obelisk made from 36,000 separate blocks of granite, the capstone weighing in at precisely 3,300 pounds. And most importantly there, exactly 13 blocks north of the White House on 16th Street, Northwest and Lafayette Square, the House of the Temple. It is the North American headquarters of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Its sacred entrance is guarded by two sphinxes and secured by 33 stone columns, each 33 feet tall. Inside its hallowed halls sits the bust of the illustrious Albert Pike. And finally, over there, said L.A. Weiss, ruling over that large bronze seal of the United States in Freedom Plaza from her home atop the Capitol building, is Persephone. She is the queen of the dead, protectress of Jesuits, patroness of the United States, and the Immaculate Virgin of Rome. Hotel California was playing softly in the background as Ali Weiss continued explaining the signs and symbols. Up ahead in the distance, Fortune observed the shimmering of the city's streetlights. Suddenly, his head grew heavy and his sight grew dim as they began to outline a curious shape from Washington Circle to DuPont Circle to Scott Circle to Logan Circle and to the east, Mount Vernon Square. Each street connected to form an inverted five-point star known to the Brotherhood as Jupiter's earthly abode, inside of which the mouth of the Baphomet rests in the Oval Office of the White House. Later on this trip, fortunate would listen spellbound to its voice as he was absorbed into wisdom, the mind of the he-goat making known to him all that he wished to learn. That concludes chapter 1976 of the White Book by Machiavelli. To purchase a physical copy, there is a link in the description and comments below. Please subscribe to this channel. Thank you.